Today we are headed out on a cruise around the San Francisco Bay. We'll voyage out under the Golden Gate Bridge, around famous Alcatraz Island, and get a unique seaside view of the beautiful city on the bay. From San Francisco to Alcatraz to the Golden Gate Bridge and beyond, we'll be covering a lot of territory today, a lot of history, and a lot of stories. San Francisco is a port city, a city with salt water in her veins. Take a good look, my friends, for this is no ordinary view. Now, the first thing I want you to do is take a deep breath of that fresh breeze. But hold on tight. The water can get choppy, even on the calmest days. So be careful if you're walking around the deck. As we pull out of the dock, look out the windows and down into the water to see some frisky sea lions. If you miss them now, we'll see some later as we return. If they are hiding today, you can always hear them. Fisherman's Wharf behind. Right now, we're passing a number of interesting sights. Look on the left or port side of the ship towards the city. Do you see a large gray battleship? That is a restored Liberty ship, the SS Jeremiah O'Brien. Next to it, tied to the pier, is a diesel submarine, the USS Pampanito. Both vessels were active in World War II. Now look out the right side of the boat, also called starboard, toward the bay. Look for a little island. later on in our tour. Now look out the front of the bow of the boat. If it's not too foggy, the bright red bridge you see is the famous Golden Gate Bridge. side of the ship toward the shore. Find the three tall masts of the old sailing ship Balclutha. The Balclutha is a steel-hulled, square-rigged cargo ship that first sailed from Wales in 1887. She carried a crew of 26 men with a load of coal and other goods bound for San Francisco. Since then, her journey has taken her as far as Australia, Cape Horn, and Europe many times over. Today, she is designated as a National Historic Monument. To the left of the Balclutha is a big white ferry boat with a black smokestack. That's the Eureka, a paddle-wheel steam ferry boat that dates back to the 1890s. Before the Great Bay Bridges were built, the Eureka transported train cars, Model T Fords, commuting passengers, and even cattle into the city. Both ships are part of the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park, also known as Hyde Street Pier. Hyde Street Pier is located at the end of the Hyde Street cable car line. You can visit the park year-round. From here, you can also see the large sign of the Ghirardelli Chocolate Factory. It's atop the red brick of the building, rising above the ships, to the left. San Francisco is famous for great food, and Ghirardelli chocolate is part of that legend. Now look farther along the shoreline. You'll see large buildings with red doors. Those are the piers of Fort Mason, one of several military locations we'll see around the bay today. John Martini is a San Francisco historian. For most 
most of its history, Fort Mason was called a port of embarkation. It's where supplies and men were loaded aboard ships and then sailed out. And during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, men sailed out of here for war in the Pacific. And then many of them, but not all, came back again to the big warehouses that were passing. Today, those piers and warehouses are a hive of activity for some of San Francisco's environmental organizations, theatrical troops, and small art galleries. International Exposition of 1915. Look for the large, dusty orange dome building set in from the shore. It is the Palace of Fine Arts, and the only building from the Pan Pacific Expo that remains today. American architect Bernard Maybach designed it in a distinctive Roman style. to the harbor. The first ship that actually entered San Francisco Bay was called the San Carlos. It was a little 80-foot-long packet boat, Lieutenant Juan Manuel de Ayala in command. 
piloted the little boat through the straits that hadn't even yet been named the Golden Gate. Treacherous, rocky straits anchored off what's now Angel Island and spent the next eight weeks uh, charting the bay and naming the geographical features. After that first boat came into the bay, a year later, on March 28, 1776, Captain Juan Batista de Anza stood on the bluff where the Presidio is now. Imagine him looking down at the narrow entrance to the bay far below. On that spot, he planted a cross in the ground and established a fort. The word Presidio translates as Army Post in Spanish, and the cross marked the northernmost point of Spain's vast empire. Father Pedro Font, who accompanied De Anza, had more of an eye for natural beauty than military strategy. That day, he wrote in his diary that if the bay could be well settled like Europe, there would not be anything more beautiful in the world. He was quite a visionary, because the beauty that Father Font saw was more rugged than the beauty we see today. Look again at the forests of the Presidio. 200 years ago, those ridges were barren rock and sand dunes. The first trees were planted there in the 1880s, a century after De Anza planted his cross. Today, the Presidio is now under the protection of the National Park Service, and many of the historic military homes have been restored into housing for local residents. It is a popular destination for hikes, and if you like movies, it is the location of Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects company that made unforgettable films like Star Wars, the Indiana Jones series, and Pirates of the Caribbean. Let your eyes sweep across the bay. We are traveling back over 150 years ago, when San Francisco was a sleepy town on a beautiful bay in the middle of nowhere. That was 1847. But in 1848... Gold! 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 On the American River! San Francisco's days as a quiet town were gone forever. At first, the town almost disappeared. Everybody in San Francisco grabbed a pick and shovel and headed for the hill. The editor of a local newspaper wrote in an editorial, The stores are closed and places of business vacated. As if a curse had arrested our onward course of enterprise. Everything is dull, monotonous, dead. That editor then locked his doors and headed for the gold fields himself. But the town didn't stay deserted for long. Young people from all over the world came here to San Francisco. In just two years, the population skyrocketed from 500 to 25,000. Look back at the city. Life in San Francisco was truly wild and woolly. At the heart of the madness was a stretch of waterfront called the Barbary Coast. These few blocks were long on action and short on law and order. In memoirs written years later, some people recalled it as a slice of heaven, while others remembered it as a corner of hell. I have seen pure liquors, bitter cigars, hundreds of that.
inspiring and recognizable as the Statue of Liberty.
to the Miwok Indians. The Miwok lived a good life in the small island paradise, hunting in the island's forests and fishing in the bay. Later, the Spanish used it as a military base, and later still, the U.S. Army set up shop. Its open spaces are lined with hiking and bicycle materials, and it is once again an island paradise in the middle of the bay. You can visit it today by taking a blue and gold fleet ferry. But there's another chapter in Angel Island's history that began in the late 1800s, when the United States government built an immigration center on the island. Angel Island became the Ellis Island of the West. For more than 50 years, thousands of Asian immigrants passed through Angel Island. Many of them were held on the island until they could prove that they had relatives already living in the United States. My name is John Jio Chin. I came here in 1924. I uh, went to the island, what they call Angel Island. The immigrants were questioned for hours, and their answers were compared with statements made by other family members. First, they asked my names, brother's names, and uh, brother and sisters. And later on, they asked about the house, how many doors, how many windows. The price of a wrong answer was deportation. But today, the old detention center houses a museum. Francisco's Asian immigrants. Men and women fought their way past legal barriers and racial prejudice to enjoy America's promised hope for their future. Men 
so dangerous that when the first batch arrived by train in 1934, not one was allowed to step down onto free soil. They simply loaded the train cars one by one on the barges and floated them out to the island with the inmates chained up inside. Rumor was that if a man died on Alcatraz, his corpse would lead the same way. Stone cold dead, but it chains. With men like these, you could never be too careful. The building you see on top of the hill was the inmate's new home, the Alcatraz cell house. One described it as a tomb of living souls. Some would stay for a year, others for 20 or 25 years or more. To get an idea of the accommodations inside, go ahead and reach your arms out as far as you can from side to side. That's how wide an Alcatraz cell is, only five feet across. Now reach your hands up high above your head. That's how tall, and only a bit longer from end to end. The cell house might look huge from here, but it was never completely filled. No more than 300 inmates lived inside at any time. 300. They could all fit on this boat ride today. from San Francisco to Oakland. Opened in 1936, the Bay Bridge is really two bridges in one, and together they span eight and a half miles across the bay. You can see the design differences quite clearly. Look at the section that connects Yerba Buena Island to San Francisco. The massive concrete pier in the center of the suspension bridge rises 200 feet above the water. It connects to a foundation of bedrock 200 feet below the surface. Above and below water, that pier is more massive than the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, and it contains more concrete than the Empire State Building. The tunnel through Yerba Buena Island is the largest diameter transportation bore tunnel in the world. The Bay Bridge received international attention when a section of the roadway collapsed during the 1989 earthquake. That section was part of the older Cantalina Bridge that connects to Oka on the other side of Yerba Buena Island. It is here you can see the new bridge design. This eastern portion of the bridge is the largest self-anchored suspension bridge in the world. The central tower rises 525 feet into the air and is designed to withstand a magnitude 8.5 earthquake. The new eastern span of the Bay Bridge costs more than $6 billion to construct, but is part of a vital link between Oakland and San Francisco that carries more than 300,000 automobiles per day. Now look at the low, flat island connected to Yuba Buena Island at the middle of the bridge. That's Treasure Island. It's an artificial island that was built as a site Thank you. 
As we cruise past the heart of the city on our way back to Fisherman's Wharf, look up at Telegraph Hill. It's the hill closest to the water, the one with the single white column on top. That's Coit Tower. Coit Tower was built to Bucky Slash by Lily Hitchcock Coit. She grew up in the city and there was a tomboy who used to chase fire engines. She quite literally would uh, bolt out a fancy formal affairs one. She heard the fire alarms going. She wrote the fireman. One local legend has it. Tower supposed to be the fire alarm in memory of her days. The fire alarm. Coit Tower is a famous San Francisco landmark. More than that, it represents the legacy of a woman who loved bright lights, adventure, and the excitement of chasing horse dog fire engines. Coit Tower is also a symbol of the grand dream.